Well, good morning. Welcome to Greenfield this morning. Great to see so many of you that are not here this morning, but you are watching this morning on your screens. And so, um, so glad that you can join us this morning. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 63, 1 to 5, that says this, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and behold your power and glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Will you join us in song this morning? of kindness you have poured out grace you brought me out of darkness you have filled me with peace in giver of mercy you're my help in time need. Lord I can't help but sing and faithful Redeemer, you have set this captive free. Lord, I can't help but sing. And faithful you are. And faithful forever you will be. And faithful. Are yes, amen. And all your promises are yes, and amen. Faithful and faithful, you are. And faithful forever, you will be. And faithful, you are. And all your promises are yes and amen and all your promises are yes and amen I will rest and I will rest in your promises confidence Is your faithfulness, and I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness, and faithful you are, and faithful forever you will be, and faithful you are. 
promises are yes and amen. And all your promises are yes and amen. And all your promises are yes and amen. Be still, my soul. The Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain and leave to thy God to order and provide in every change he faithful will remain and be still my soul thy best thy heavenly friend through thorny ways lead to a joyful still my soul thy God doth undertake to guide the future as he has the past thy hope thy confidence let nothing shake all now mysterious shall be bright at last be still my soul Though waves and winds still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. In you I rest, in you I found my hope, in you I trust, you'll never let me go. I place my life within your hand. soul the hour is hastening on when we shall be forever with the lord when disappointment grief and fear are gone sorrow forgot love's purest joys restored and be still my soul when change and tears are past all safe and blessed we shall meet at last in you i rest in you i found my hope in you i trust you'll never let me go i place my life within your hands Good morning, Greenfield. I'm so glad this morning to guide us in a prayer time. I know this is kind of weird to pray as I'm here and you're at home, but I would like to guide us through a prayer where I'm going to give some space for you to pray in your hearts. You can pray out loud wherever you are and just follow along as we pray together. Let's turn to prayer. God, as we turn to prayer, we want to first take our hands and with our palms facing down in a posture of humility, we want to lay down at your feet our worries, our fears, our concerns. Lay down our desire to control everything. Lay down everything that we are. And with our hands open, Father, we receive the Holy Spirit we receive the spirit of love, joy, and peace. We receive your truth and your guidance. We want to breathe in the breath of God that sustains and fills us with all good things. God, as your word says in Psalm 63, we honestly seek you. We thirst for you. 
Right now, we want to praise you for who you are and how you satisfy our needs and desires. God, there have been times during the season of change, of stress and difficulty, where we have not trusted in you, where we have allowed ourselves to get sidetracked in our relationship with you as we have become rocked by the waves around us. Right now, we want to confess our sin, our times of distrust, and times of fear. God, also in these difficult times, we have not acted well. We have treated the people around us poorly as we have lashed out in stress and in our own pain. God, right now we want to confess before you the times we have not treated people like they deserve. God, we now lift up in prayer those who we have treated poorly, those we have not given our best selves to, and those we have let bear the brunt of our stress. We also lift up the leaders we, had bad, we have bad-mouthed, the people we have ranted about, and those we have judged harshly. We pray for them now and pray that we may see them as you see them, that they may know your love and presence. God, in these unprecedented times, many of us have lost our footing in how we go about our relationship with you, how we serve you and how we serve others. Will you give us a new imagination and new ideas for how to love intentionally while we are physically distanced from people? Will you guide our hearts in this new rhythm and new reality? God, we thank you that you are with us, that your spirit lifts us and guides us. We thank you that there is nowhere we can go that you are not, and nothing in this world changes who you are and how much you love us. God, we receive your love and your presence. Will you fill us by your spirit and help us be aware of your presence with us? We will praise you as long as we live, and in your name we will lift up our hands. It is our hope and desire to love and honor you in whatever we are doing and with all that we have. We love you, God, our Father, on whom we build our lives. We love you, Jesus Christ, our Savior and friend. We love you, Holy Spirit, our comforter and indwelling presence of God. Help us to breathe you in every day. In your name we pray. Amen. I know we have all been affected by social distancing and the reality of our current situation. And some people we want to remember right now are our missionaries whom we support and we love. 
They are also dealing with this strange reality. And we're so blessed this morning to have a wonderful update from Lindell and Paolo from Brazil. So enjoy that now. I'm Lindell and this is Paolo and we're missionaries supported Hi. by the church that are in Southern Brazil. And we're just um, excited to be able to share with you a little bit about what's happening here. We, like you, are in self-isolation because of COVID that um, is happening all over the world. But we are glad to say that Brazil has not been hit really hardly. So things are, are going well here. I think, you know, they're saying that we're being able to flatten the curve. So that's, that's good news. And actually, the whole rural area around us, they're, it's business as usual. They're not in isolation like we are. At the seminary, we've been able to continue to have our classes. Um, we've already been using Zoom as a technology to teach our classes to those students from you know, further away. And so the students from the local students, they've been able to adapt pretty well to going online and having those classes. And we even have a professor from the United States who's teaching from the United States. And I, I'm in on the classes so that I can be his an interpreter. So. Um, and my life hasn't changed a whole lot because my office is at home, but um, we're just con conscious of, uh, of the fact that our students, you know, they're making these adjustments. Some of them are being isolated as well. And so we've been doing our best to keep up with them. One of our students is right on the front line working in the hospital. So we've been um, trying our best to support her during this process too. Now, now I'll hand you over to Paulo who will give you another uh, update. Well, um, I continue to take care of our church, and visiting people, not visiting people, to talk to them using a WhatsApp, and once a week I go to the church and have some meetings, and I continued, uh, I started actually again my, my English classes with my students. Uh, and uh, uh, because uh, part of my ministry is to teach the young. And uh, uh, I'm planning to start again my classes uh, for people to have a test this year to join the university again uh, online because we cannot have meetings, uh, gatherings yet here uh, either. So, this is my ministry now, and I'm praying to praying for, for my home uh, a lot for people in situations, and uh, I pray for this uh, lockdown done too. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And our church, we um, we're Paula pastors. We've actually gone online, like many of you, ah, yes, using Zoom. Our church isn't very big, so we can have that interaction, and then. We've increased our services, so we now have a midweek service, and that's focused on prayer during this time. So, yeah, so we just want to thank you so much for all thank your you. prayers and things like that, yeah. and continue to pray for our ministries, pray that we'll be able to continue to be sensitive to the needs of the people around us during this time, so that we can, you know, make sure they have everything that they're needing. Um, we're just, you know, blessed that we have technology here in Brazil that we can continue to, to do our ministry, and so we're very thankful for that. And and if you remember to pray for Daisy, our student on the front line, we really appreciate that too. God is opening doors for her. She's been able to um, witness, and and also her her colleagues have asked her to begin every shift with prayer. So God is really using her. So we we pray God can keep her there and keep her safe. But thanks so much for all your prayers. Thanks so much for all your support. Thank you. And we look forward to being able to be with you in person next year, if possible. Um, but yeah, God bless you all. And we pray for you that God will care for you during this, this challenging time that we're all facing. Good morning, all. I've been playing the silliest game with Kenzie this week. And by this week, I mean for the last year. It's essentially a weird game of freeze tag where we run around our kitchen island over and over and over and over again until we run out of speed and run so slow that we can't catch each other. So then we have to go and ask Andrea for a mission. These missions range from, Kenzie, your mission is to give me a hug, to Chris, clean up the mess Addison made in the living room. 
Um, once these missions are completed, we are rewarded with super speed and then continue to run around the island over and over and over and over and over again until we slow down again. In which case we rinse and repeat, ask for another mission to gain super speed again. And Kenzie loves this game. So my first question for you is this. What is your favorite game to play with your family? Nice. It is so fun to play. Now, today's short lesson is going to be about the last part of the book of John. And in it, just like Kenzie and I have missions given to us to gain super speed, Jesus is give, gives a mission to the disciples. Um, before we read a few verses together, though, I have another question. What was the best mission you have ever been on? Cool. Okay, let's read our Bible passage together. John 20, 19-23 says, On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. That's the mess mission. Jesus says, I am sending you. Seems like a pretty big mission, right? But what does it mean? And to figure that out, I have a mission for you. Now, I need you to go find some paper and a writing tool of some kind. It could be a pen, maybe a pencil, a highlighter, a crayon, a marker, your mom's lipstick, whatever. Find it and come back. Parents, feel free to pause the video for that to happen. Okay, so our mission is to figure out what Jesus meant and how we can do it too. On your paper, I need you to make a big T chart. And on one side, I need you to write Jesus. And on the other side, I want you to write me. You can take a few seconds to do that. Now, let's remember that Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So in order to understand that, we need to figure out exactly what Jesus was sent to earth to do. Do you guys have any ideas? Love God? Yeah. Let's write that down. We can put a big heart and then write God next to it. Jesus was sent to come to earth and love God and told us to do likewise. Love each other? Good answer. Let's do that one too. Love each other. Can we write that one down as well, everyone? Again, parents, feel free to pause to help make this happen if you need to. And another one, love our neighbors? Good answer. Love neighbors. Good job, guys. I hear one more in the back. What was that one? Subvert the cultural system of Rome at the time and challenge the injustices of inequality that exist due to the hierarchical system of elitism? Who said that? Hmm. You know, that might be a little bit much for us to tackle today, but maybe in a couple of years we'll get to that one. Now, that we've established what Jesus was sent to do, let's think about how we can be sent to do those things too. So what are some ways we can love God? We can sing his praises, we can worship him, yeah? Let's write that down. Worship. What else can we do? We can pray? Yeah, he wants to be in relationship with us. And praying is how we can speak to him. Now, move on, how do we love each other? Yeah, sometimes we don't have a lot of people around us right now, but those people who are around us, we can tell them we love them by using our words. We can also give them hugs. I'm sure your parents or grandparents, whoever you're with would love a hug. We can do something nice. Yeah, that's right. Good answers. Now, how do we love our neighbors? We can bake for them. Good answer, guys. What else can we do? Yeah, we can write letters, or maybe if you're not writing yet, you can draw pictures. Maybe those pictures could even be on a postcard. 
and you can send a postcard to someone who needs it. These are excellent answers and excellent parts of the mission we can be on. Just remember that the passage we talked about today was about that mission and Jesus gave a mission to his disciples and that mission can extend to us as well. So let's accept that mission this week and go out and accomplish it. So good morning, welcome to Greenfield. Uh, I trust that we are all uh, learning how to lean into this time that we find ourselves in and to adjust to this new normal. Um, I, I know for myself that I, I find that my mood is far better when the sun is shining and I'm looking forward this week especially that we will get to, uh, I think we're getting up to 18 on, on Monday or Tuesday and so we'll enjoy uh, going for walks and just even enjoy being in my backyard and I think we're planning a barbecue uh, to do some hamburgers on, the, on Tuesday so come on down uh, to our place. Uh, and join us while well, you can't, sorry about that. But uh, just think about that. Maybe this week plan to have a barbecue yourself. So um, this morning's passage, we're, we're looking at a passage which I think that um, the, the contents of that we would be familiar, right? Because it's about the sending of the church and the sending of the disciples. Um, and so as we come to this morning's passage, I'd like us to uh, pray together first. So let's pray together. So um, Father God, as we turn now to your word, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and redeemer. And may you give us all ears to hear what you are saying to us through your living word. In Jesus' name, amen. So today's passage is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. This uh, passage happens right at, at, at the same day that, Mary, that, that Peter and, and John and Mary discovered the empty tomb and that Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene later on. And so this is a continuation of what's happening that very night. And so the passage, as many passages do, nicely falls into three parts. And so you have Jesus appearing to his disciples and greeting them and extending grace to them. And then you have Jesus sending and commissioning his disciples in verse 21. And then the last two verses, you have Jesus equipping and authorizing his disciples to be agents of shalom for the world. And so as we uh, dig into this passage today, let's begin by reading the first couple verses. So I'm reading from the NIV translation. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. So the situation of the disciples before they encountered Jesus here was uh, one of failure and fear, right? That you have, and it's very hard for us to put ourselves in their shoes. That the last few days for them have, have been topsy-turvy and they, they probably, you know, that they uh, saw their, their master and Lord, their rabbi, their teacher, you know, arrested, tortured, beaten you know, crucified. And then there was days of silence where they didn't know what happened. But then on that first Sunday, the tomb was empty. And Jesus, you know, appeared, uh, the risen Christ appeared to Mary Magdalene. Um, and, and so um, it's very difficult for us to understand what they were going through um, and, and obviously, they were still processing all of this. And one of the challenges I think that we find is that they didn't even have the categories by which to understand what was going on, right? Like, you know, that we sort of look at it from retrospect and think, well, you know, Jesus talked a lot about that, how he was going to die and, and, and come again. And, and we look at the Old Testament and we sort of see the prophecies. But, but from their perspective, as they're living in that moment, we realize just how little they could grasp and understand. 
And so I think that we have to cut them some slack and realize that, yeah, they are still processing all of this. And so, you know, they were numb with grief. They were riddled with regrets. Like Peter had denied his, his Lord, his master, three times. Uh, they were hiding in a locked room. Right? They, they weren't sure what the Jewish authorities were going to do or if they were safe. They were fearful of them. And, and they weren't sure what to make of Peter and John's testimony of the empty tomb or Mary Magdalene's story of the risen Christ. And so, you know, I think that if we saw sort of a before picture and an after picture of the disciples, it would be so radically different. That this is the same, it's hard to believe that this is the same group, the same, uh, you know, group of disciples, the followers of Jesus, who then went um, after this, after Jesus had appeared to them a number of times and after they were given the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and that that's the same group that turned the world upside down. Now, um, this sort of before and after thing, um, you know, there's been a whole number of memes uh, that have been online, of course, about, you know, what, what are we going to look like whenever we get out of this quarantine. And, and this is one of uh, one that I saw that I, I, I thought was one of my favorites, Tom Hanks, right? Me, day one of quarantine, Mr. Rogers, all nice and clean shaven, and then me, day 21 of quarantine. Now, for myself... Um, you know, you notice that my beard is looking rather luscious and full. Um, I hope by the end of all this that I, I will aspire to look a little bit more like ZZ Top. So, so we'll see how that goes. Or maybe Moses. Um, I, at least I imagine that Moses had a huge beard. Um, anyways, that's just a little bit of fun. So, um, so Jesus, in this state that they find themselves, Jesus comes among them. And he greets them and he extends grace to them. And he says, peace be with you. Shalom Aleichem. Um, and, and I think that we shouldn't just see this as him saying, hi, how's it going, guys? You know, but this, you know, this was a sort of a typical greeting in many ways in the ancient world. Uh, Shalom Aleichem. Um, but I think the fact that it's repeated twice and in the context of the Gospel of John, I think it just takes on this whole new meaning, um, especially in light of the fact that Jesus had talked about and, and had promised this sort of shalom, this sort of peace to his disciples in chapter 14, where he says to them, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And so here you have Jesus coming among his disciples, and they're all afraid, they're all scared, they're troubled. And he says just the right words to them to settle their hearts and to encourage them. And then it's these words that are exactly what they needed to hear at that time because um, they needed God's shalom, God's enduring peace uh, the most. And, and I think what's significant about this idea of peace or shalom is that this is uh, something that's characteristic of the new age, right? And this new age has begun, um, you know, in the resurrection of Jesus. That in the resurrection, the death and resurrection of Jesus, that the, the future, the future new age, the blessings of the future, now they have invaded the present. And that part of that characteristic is peace and joy, and that they can have that and they are experiencing that now. And of course, you know, as Jesus is there with them, he shows them um, his, his hands and his side. Um, and his very presence with them, that that turns their sorrow into joy. Um, and, and this peace is theirs uh, for the taking and for the experiencing despite trials, no matter what they're going through. And what they will encounter. But he doesn't just stop there. Uh, he doesn't just, um, you, know, you know, grant him his peace and his shalom. But I think that we have to remember, then he commissions him. And, and we have to remember that this gift of peace is never meant just to be for them. But on the contrary, that he has chosen and appointed them, and, and those of us that follow after, to be bearers of shalom or bearers of peace 
that we bring into the life of the world. So Jesus continues then in verse 19 and says to his disciples, um, again, he says, peace be with you. As I am sending the Father, so I am sending you. And this passage is the foundational passage for the sentness of the church, for the mission of the church. Um, <clears throat> and we hear a fair amount about the Great Commission, right? Like that's usually when we think of missionaries and mission work, it's usually, you know, Matthew chapter 28 that's at the forefront of our mind. Right? That you know, all authority is being, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So, and, and therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. And that's sort of the default passage that we think of when it comes to mission. But I want to argue that this passage, while that may be the great commission, this is the greatest commission. That this passage in, in Gospel of John is really the fundamental passage about the mission and the purpose of the church. And the reason why is because it's a commission. Um, that it's a commissioning. That our sending is intimately related to, indeed it's an extension and part of, the Father sending of Jesus. And so we participate in the triune nature of God in the sending, the Father sending the Son. Uh, and then uh, together them sending the Spirit and then uh, the Spirit sending the church. And we have to always remember, and, and you've heard it here before, that mission is God's mission first. And we participate by grace in who God is and what God is doing. Now I want to dig a little bit down into this verse 21 um, and, and just highlight some of the, the ways even the Greek is, is significant in it. So, so the passage is, as the Father has sent me, and that's a Greek perfect tense, I am sending, present tense, you. Uh, this is similar to what Jesus says in chapter 17, verse 18, where he says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And so there's a number of things to note. First, um, the use of the Greek tenses in this, you know, so for the sending of the, the Father sending the Son, it's in the Greek perfect tense. And so the Greek perfect usually describes an event completed in the past that has enduring results into the present. Um, this is sort of one of the, you know, there, there's some things in Greek which are noteworthy uh, and others which are just commonplace, a translation gathered. But the perfect tense is one that grammarians look at and say that when something is in the perfect tense in Greek, that you need to take note. Um, and so uh, one Greek scholar talks about, he says, the force of the perfect is that it describes this event completed in the past and has enduring results, which implies ascending in the past that continues to hold good in the present. And such is the force of the Greek perfect tense. Um, and they go on to say that the mission of Christ is here regarded not in the point of its historical fulfillment. You know, it's not a one and done. But in the permanence of its effects. The second thing to note is that the second sending of Jesus sending us, the church, is that that's in the present tense. And the Greek present tense usually portrays an event that's in the process, that's, that, that without it really isn't talking about the beginning or end in view. And, and so here I think that when it talks about our sentness as the church, as the body of Christ, that it's this durative idea, it's this continual, that it never ends. That it doesn't matter whether we're 18 years old or, or 93 years old or anywhere in between or older or younger. It doesn't matter whether we are here in Edmonton or halfway across the world, that, or no matter what we're doing, but as Christ followers that we are always sent, that it's part of our very DNA. It's part of who we are as Christ followers. And so this has um, a number of implications. And 
<clears throat> this Greek, another Greek grammarian talks about this interesting. He says that the form of the fulfillment of Christ's mission was now to be changed. But the mission itself was still continued and is still effective. We, the disciples and all who come after them, were commissioned to carry on Christ's work and not to begin a new one. And so there's this massive continuity between Christ's mission, Jesus' mission, and what he was doing, and then the mission of the church and what we are called to do. And so there's three massive implications of this for us. Um, and so first, our sending is based on the prior sending of the Son. Over 40 times in the Gospel of John, Jesus is described as the one sent by the Father. And I'm not going to read them all for you. Um, I, I didn't even put all the references in, in the slides. Um, but in John 17, verse 3, um, it says, Now this is eternal life, Jesus is saying, that they may know you, the one and only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Right? And so there's this, this idea that throughout the gospel, that, that, that as the Father has sent Jesus, that, that is what it means and what is part of, you know, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, that God has sent him to save the world. This is found throughout the you know, Gospel of John, but also found in the epistles of John as well. And so you have in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So our sending is based on the prior sending of the son, that there's this relationship between the two. And, and our missions are, are, you know, that we are participating in their mission as we are invited. Second, our sending is a participation in the very nature of the triune God. Okay, I'm not going to sort of get into, uh, you know, much about the Trinity or anything like that. But just to note a couple things here. And one is that, you know, the, of course, you know, we're talking about sending and mission as one and the same. And they are sort of go back to the same words, right? The Latin word for send um, is uh, missio. Right? And so there's a sense that uh, it's really the same word, it's just a different language. Um, but long before sending or mission was used for uh, the church or for the people of God, um, it was used theologically to describe an aspect of the relationship between the different members of the Trinity. Um, and so Thomas Aquinas, in his Summa Theologica, he talks about two sendings or two Trinitarian missions. The mission and sending of the Son by the Father, and then the mission and sending of the Spirit, and that's I just that's a Greek icon, a, a, a ancient image of where it has the Father and the Son and the Spirit represented in it, um, and I think that it's significant that um, the Church has its origin in this Trinitarian mission of God, right, and so it's an extension of that to the world. And so our sending is a participation in the very nature of the triune God. And then finally, um, you know, the third aspect uh, is that our sending is plural. And let's just go back to verse 21. It says, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. And, and the you there in Greek is plural. It's not talking about I'm sending you, Tyler, but it's, it's instead he's saying I'm sending you, the disciples, the church, the people of God. And so I think we have to realize that the witness of the body of Christ to the sentness of Jesus, and this is fundamental, right? This is, you know, if we understand God as love, as John is wont to do, then, you know, we understand that it's as we love one another and we have the, the love command. Right, that as, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another, from John 13. And that's sort of 
part of this, this, this highlights is as we love one another, as we care for one another, as we bear one another's burdens, as we pray for one another, that that is a, 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 an example and a witness to the world of what the love of God is. And that they will know that we are truly Christ's followers by our love. And that goes even further in chapter 17, where it's our love for one another and it's our, and our, it's our express unity within this community of Christ followers, that when people see that, that they will know that, that the Father has sent the Son. So in John 17, verse 21, it says, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And so this idea of the sending of the church and this participation in the very nature of, of the triune God is absolutely essential to our witness to the world around us. Now, Ross Hastings, in his book-length engagement with these verses, um, says this, The church is this apologetic when the dynamics of the triune life and love of God continue in and through it. And when the sentness of Jesus by the Father is perpetuated in the sentness of the church by the Spirit. And so what he's saying in that is that, that as we lean into this divine life that we have, that, this abiding with God that we have and are invited to, you know, through Jesus Christ and through the forgiveness of sins that is possible through what Jesus has done on the cross. It's as we lean into that and share in that the dynamics of this triune life, that that is sort of the apologetic to the world, that God loves them, that God has sent his son uh, to, to die on the cross so that they may have life. So the significance of all this is, should be apparent. Right, So that mission is absolutely essential and central to what all that we do as a church. It's not a, a side thing. It's not, well, we have discipleship and we have um, uh, um, worship and all this sort of stuff. And then there's another sort of thing that's tagged on at the end that we, well, we have outreach. But know that, that for everything that we do, we do by virtue of the sentness that we have. And so as Jake and Elward Blues say that, you know, that we're all on a mission from God. A little bit of humor, sorry. Um, right now people would laugh, but ha 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 ha, okay. Um, so now this third section, it, it continues here. And then you have, so Jesus doesn't just send us, but he also equips and authorizes his disciples. And so reading from verse uh, 21, and with that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, um, there's a number of, of controversies about this passage, these two verses, um, but I, I just really want to focus on you know, what it's actually saying. And so, the biggest thing, I think, is to realize that Jesus didn't just send them and leave them on their own, right? But rather, uh, he didn't send us without support, but he, he sent the paraclete, the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, that the, and you have this equipping role of the Holy Spirit, this, this comforting role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Um, and this is something that was promised uh, it was foreshadowed throughout the gospel, and it's a fulfillment of Jesus' specific promise. And I give the references there to the number of places where he, he talks specifically about the promised paraclete that he is sending them, uh, sending, sending us. Um, but it's just very much to note that our sending, right, our purpose, our mission, uh, is empowered by the Holy Spirit within us. That God doesn't leave us on our own. He doesn't abandon us. But he sends his spirit to indwell us, to be with us. 
you know, as we go out on mission and join him on mission in the world. So he doesn't leave us as, as representatives of, of, of an absent master. But we bear in our life and the way that we live in our life together um, the same power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. The same power that, that and the same divine relationship that you see between the members of the Trinity, that we take that with us as we participate, as we abide. Um, and it brings up this image of the vine again from John 15. And then verse 23 um, is, is a tough verse as well. And, and, you know, how do we understand this idea of forgiveness of sins? Is it, is it really saying that if, if, if we forgive someone, that then they'll be forgiven? Um, now, I think, first and foremost, we have to realize that forgiveness of sins is at the very heart of the gospel. Right? That, that, that is a whole gospel message, Jesus, that, that the Father sent the Son to die on the cross. Why? So that there may be forgiveness of sins. You know, for salvation. You know, that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world by virtue of his obedience uh, in life and his obedience in death on the cross and his resurrection. And then we even see that the role of the paracleter, the Holy Spirit, is to convict the world in respect to sin. And so the message that we bear as Christ followers and that we bear witness to and we share with others is a message of forgiveness. But we have to remember that, and, and I think we all know this, but let's just remind ourselves that only God can forgive sins. Right? And even as we've been going through the Gospel of John, that's what sometimes people were so, uh, so taken aback of, of, of Jesus' ministry because there's times where he forgave sins. And they consider that blasphemy because only God can forgive sins. So whatever this passage means, it doesn't mean um, that, that, that we somehow forgive sins. Okay, that's, that's something for God to do and only God to do. But it does suggest that we are somehow involved in the process. And, and I'm not exactly sure of this, but it seems to me that it relates somehow to our role as image bearers. Right, who are being renewed in the image of the Son continually. And, and as such, as we, as we uh, grow in our relationship with Christ and as we are continually transformed into this image, that it's a renewal of this idea that we were originally created to be image bearers, to be co-regents with God. So, it seems that in this passage, a couple of notes here, is that the actual forgiveness is God's doing. Right? In the passage, it's actually, uh, or in the passage, it's the passives, right, that um, they seem to imply divine agency, that their sins are forgiven, that, or are not forgiven. That has nothing to do with our agency, but rather um, our role simply is declaratory is um, as we share the gospel um, and as we uh, share the offer of forgiveness available through the cross of Jesus Christ, as we pray with people and they, they come in repentance to Jesus and as we remind them after they've confessed that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that as we engage with other people and, and as they encounter and come to God through the gospel message, that we are participating uh, in this. And, and so, you know, like in James chapter 5, verse 16, you know, it says that therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other uh, so that you may be healed. So that isn't saying that, that our... Um, that, you know, praying to one another or, or that we need to go see someone else for confession. No, that Jesus is our high priest and that we have direct access with God because of what Jesus has done on the cross and in his death and resurrection. But it does suggest that there is this tangible benefit at times that when we, uh, when someone comes to Christ and when we pray with them and when we share with them 
for them to hear from another human, you know, that your sins are forgiven. And so we're just kind of passing on the message and affirming that message in their life. Ross Hastings again says, and, and, and I, I like this idea, where he says that this is the grace of the gospel, that within any fellowship of believers, anyone, uh, any who hear a sincere confession of faith and repentance may pronounce forgiveness. Because every believer is indwelled by the Spirit, as the apostles were, and every believer is a sent one from Jesus, as Jesus was sent from the Father. So, <clears throat> what does all this look like? What difference does this make for us, especially under COVID? Um, you know, I think we have to understand that just as God sent His Son, Jesus sends us to continue His work and to share His life. That at this time, no matter what the conditions are outside, whether or not we have to isolate physically from one another, whether or not um, we have to be under quarantine or isolation, that we have to realize that God's mission hasn't changed. Right? His redemptive mission to the world hasn't changed, and nor has our mission as God's people changed. And this sentness is part of the very DNA of the church. And it's part of the DNA of each one of us as Christ followers. And now how it looks uh, in our lives will be different for each of us, depending on uh, your gifts, uh, your temperament, your personality. But nonetheless, that this is something which that we all are asked, because of the hospitality of God, that we are asked to look out to others and to offer that same hospitality, that same love. And I think this is something which is not just when we're, we're, when we're scattered as we are now, but it's the sentness is both in our gathering and our scattering, that they both express our sentness. And as we gather together, um, even as we all engage in this message together, right? We aren't here in the room together, but we're still uh, at, the, at, you know, during this time, you know, hearing from God's word together. And as, you know, as we gather, we're reminded that we worship and serve a missionary God. We worship and serve a God who is concerned for, for each of the lost sheep, even for the, the, the one versus the 99. And as we scatter, as we leave here, as we go to our homes and our workplaces uh, and our schools and, and as we walk six feet apart from other people, uh, you know, down the walking paths that we scatter. At that point, we're joining God on mission in our neighborhoods and through our networks. And we need to find creative ways to love one another and our neighbors at this time. And one of the questions uh, for discussion for the sermon is to brainstorm. You know, well, how can we? You know, show our love, and, and how can you check in on your neighbors or the vulnerable? Uh, how can we show our love to those that are homeless? And there's many ways that we can do it. You can go drive by and visit someone. If you go for a walk, you can always pop in, you know, ring their doorbell and stand back your two meters and just, just have a brief conversation and see how they're doing. Um, you can have your kids draw pictures or postcards for people that are shut in. And you can, and, and we, we can somehow get them to them, right? Or, or email them or send them. So there's lots of things that we can do. And I think these small acts of kindness, even when you're walking, you know, to, to smile, look people in the eye as you're going past and say, how are you doing? You know, or hi, or, or God bless you, whatever. Because, you know, like I find so many people are walking and they're walking in fear and their eyes are down. They don't even want to make you know, eye contact with other people. Okay, and that's where we have to, uh, you know, just not give in to that fear. So we need to find creative ways to love one another and our neighbors at this time. And then finally, we need to remember that Jesus doesn't send us without support. That he comes with us. That he is already working in our neighborhoods 
and in among our networks and friends and that we are joining him. And so this should blow us out of our, our you know, just, just should blow our minds that the triune God, through the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, goes in us and with us and ahead of us. And so we're not left alone. And so I hope these words are an encouragement to you this week. I hope that, that you know, as we struggle through this together, um, as we sort of, you know, continue this, it's going to be probably longer than any of us expected. But I hope that as we do that, we can take comfort in the fact that, that God is with us. Amen.
encourage you to take some time and to look at the sermon discussion questions and, and to reflect a little bit further on today's passage. Um, also, if you would like uh, some prayer, whether you want someone to pray with you or, or, or for you, uh, please contact a member of the, the prayer team that's listed on the website and in the downloadable handout for today. Uh, and then finally, please join us at 1130 for our Zoom time or connect time. This is just a wonderful time where we can see each other's faces and we can, you know, we split up into smaller groups and we can uh, share and pray for one another. So let's, let's pray now as we uh, close. Um, you, know, you know what? I have an idea. Okay, so just hold on. Okay, Andrew, okay, come, come with me here. Um, yeah, I just want to remind us. So, so here, here we are in the sanctuary and okay, yeah, Tim and Irene, hey guys, how are you doing? Uh, marshals are usually somewhere around here as well. Um, I think like, you know, Alan and Lori and, and Joe are here. So, you know, as we come back to the, to the sanctuary, just to, to remind us that when we, every Sunday when we leave the sanctuary, that we leave underneath this sign from, with this passage from uh, today's scripture, you know, that peace be with you as a father has sent me, so I send you. And so I just want to remind us that as you go out this week, or as you stay in this week, uh, and look out your window, pray for your neighbors. You know, say hi to people when you're walking uh, with them. And just let's think of creative ways, you know, to love one another and to love our neighbors. Because as Christ followers, no matter what we're doing, we're sent by God. And we bear witness to the, the love and the message of the gospel, which is to, that, that you, we can have forgiveness, you know, through what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. And that forgiveness is, is not only forgiveness and reconciliation with God, but also for one another. So let's, let's pray together now. Father, we thank you for sending us your Son so that we may have peace, both with you and with one another. Father and Son, we thank you for sending us the paraclete, your Holy Spirit, to comfort, to guide, and lead us. And we thank you, God, for sending us, for including us in your mission to this world. And now, triune God, as we join you on mission in the world, bearing witness to your great love and declaring the forgiveness that, that forgiveness is possible in Jesus Christ, Help us love you more and more. Help us love one another and help us love our neighbors. In Jesus' name, amen. Go with God's blessing.